وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم Warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise is due for Allah Azza wa Jal alone. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to exalt the mention and grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his family and his companions. We're talking about educating our children Islamically. And of course, as we've mentioned in the previous episodes, it's not so much necessarily about you being the one to, as a parent, to necessarily do all of that education, but at least that you understand how to educate your children Islamically. And I really want to sort of emphasize what we had mentioned at the end of the previous episode regarding the fact that every parent ideally would go through a text on how to seek knowledge, a, a fundamental text on how to seek knowledge. And Alhamdulillah, with regard to Al Madrasatul Umariya, we'll do our best to put some links with this video to other videos from the teachers at Al Madrasatul Umariya that relate to how to seek knowledge in a more detailed way. Because ultimately, yes, how to seek knowledge, that's from the view of the student, but as a parent, it also tells you what your children should be doing to seek knowledge. So you can apply it as a parent as well. And of course, we said every parent should be aiming to be an example for their children, so you gain the best of both worlds in that way. We're continuing on with just a summary of this, kind of a, a synopsis or a brief uh, overview of some of the most important points that you're going to need in order to teach your children Islamically. And what we're going to start with now is the principle that knowledge is done in steps and in stages. In steps and in stages with tadarruj. And we can take this from an ayah in Surah Al Furqan, in which Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدَةً Allah said that the disbelievers say, would it not be that if the Qur'an, why was the Qur'an not sent down in one go? Why was the Qur'an not just given to the Prophet like that? One go, from the, you know, straight from the heavens. There's the Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha to Surah Al-Nas. Jumlatan wahida. Why not like that? Allah said, in this way, we made your heart firm. And we can take from this a principle that the best way to be firm in knowledge is to take it step by step and to take it with a tadarruj in steps and in stages, piece by piece, step by step. And sometimes one of the mistakes that a lot of parents make in this regard is that, and we all make it, to be honest, I make it, all the time, you know, subhanAllah. In the sense that what we tend to do is we tend to crave to do everything at once. We want everything in one go. You know, we say that today I'm going to finish this book from beginning to end. And today I'm going to memorize this many hadith. And today I'm going to do this and that. And we have that same mentality of wanting everything, jumlatan wahida, wanting everything to come in, in the instant. Instead of saying, let me just take a small amount every day. Let me take a small amount every week. Let me just continue and be regular in that as long as you're on the right path. And by the right path, I don't mean that you're on the right path in terms of your belief or your Islam. I mean that you're on the right path for knowledge. You're actually taking the knowledge in the right way. Then inshallah, even if you're taking baby steps, those baby steps have an advantage, which is that as long as you are actually learning the right way, you're on the right path for knowledge in terms of you are actually approaching it the right way, studying the right things, using the right methodology, then if you are taking baby steps, those baby steps are advantageous because they allow your knowledge to be more firm. And that's why Allah gave the Quran to the Prophet over 23 years. كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ So that your heart would become firm on it. 
you would take it step by step, page by page, ayah by ayah. That is going to make someone far more firmly grounded than taking something in one go. Now, that doesn't mean, and someone shouldn't understand from that, that we don't push our children to memorize the whole Quran and we say, no, 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 you should you know, memorize the Quran over this length. If it's easy for the child to memorize the Quran when they're little, amazing. But the knowledge from that is going to come to them piece by piece in terms of the uh, the the rulings, the, the understanding, the tafsir, the tadabbur, the reflection and pondering. That's going to come, you know, day by day and piece by piece. It's not going to come in one go. So there's nothing wrong with the child pushing them at an early age to memorize, as we mentioned in the previous episode, because this is the time they have the time and the ability to do that. So there's nothing wrong with pushing the children to memorize at that age. Uh, but in terms of the understanding, that's going to be piece by piece and stage by stage. And even if you can't take hifth jumlat and wahida, you can't memorize what you memorize in one go, you lose it in one go. Whatever you memorize in one go, you lose in one go. That's, the, that's how it works. Whatever you memorize in small amounts and stages, generally it stays with you. And that's an important lesson as it relates to hifth. And again, we really need to have a whole discussion which is outside of the topic of this uh, short course, um, which is to have a whole discussion on how to do hifth, how to memorize. And inshallah, again, if we have resources via al madrasa al umariya inshallah, we'll post those and link those along with the video, inshallah ta'ala. So this ayah in Surah Al-Furqan tells us about the need for us to learn uh, things stage by stage. And we have another evidence for this or another thing that I would like to bring you. It's actually a story from the seerah of Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was one of the great imams of Islam, one of the great scholars of hadith, one of the figures that stands out in Islamic history, Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala. And this relates to the mother of Sufyan al-Thawri. She said, Ya Bunay, O oh my son, O oh my small son, إِذَا كَتَبْتَ عَشَرَةَ أَحَادِيثِ she said, if you write down 10 hadith, she sent him off to study hadith. She said, if you write down 10 hadith or 10 letters, فَانْظُرْ هَلْ تَرَى فِي نَفْسِكَ زِيَادَةً فِي مَشِّكَ وَحِلْمِكَ وَوَقَارِكَ She said, do you see that, you know, look at yourself, write 10 hadith. When you've written 10 hadith, look at yourself and ask yourself, am I becoming Am I, do I see in myself that I am getting an increase in terms of my patience, in terms of my progress, in terms of my, uh, my manners and my behavior and the fear that I have of Allah? She said, فَإِن لَمْ تَرَ ذَلِكْ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ يَضُرُّكَ وَلَا يَنْفَعُكَ She said, if you don't see this change in yourself, then know that it is harming you, it's not benefiting you. And subhanAllah, that is really a, an amazing, amazing lesson. There are so many lessons within this, but two things I wanted to highlight. Number one, the tadarruj. Learn 10 hadith, then write 10 more. In some of the wordings it mentions that she sent him to write 10 hadith, and she said that if you see this change in yourself, then write 10 more. 10 more. And if you still see it, write 10 more. And if you still see it, write 10 more, like that. And the other thing is that what is the ghaya? What's the goal? Is the goal knowledge for knowledge's sake? That's subhanAllah, you feel that's what it's become in this time that we live in. It's become al takathur. You've been, your hearts have become preoccupied with numbers. Just getting knowledge for the sake of knowledge, degrees for the sake of degrees and masters and PhDs and whatever, and just gathering together things for the sake of a takath, or just to, to say that you have the numbers, or you have the, the, the paper trail, or you have the qualifications, or the person collects ijazat and says, I have so many ijazat in this and that. But subhanAllah, that's not what matters. What matters is what you act upon. If that doctorate made you fear Allah more, then go and get another one, and another one, and another one. If that ijazah made your prayer better, go and get another one and another one. If that knowledge that you took from that shaykh made you 
closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then go and seek more. But ultimately know this, that if you're not seeing those changes in yourself, know that this is harming you, it's not benefiting you. Because knowledge is either a hujjah for you or against you. It's either an evidence for you or against you. Either it will witness on your behalf or it will witness against you. So you have to look at your children. And this is again, really important that we're not saying to our children, oh, I'm seeing he's not changing, so tell him to stop doing talab al Because that's just gonna help the shaitan against your child. And it's not gonna help you or your child in anything. But you're constantly telling your child, like the mother of Sufyan al-Thawri, emphasizing to them that if you're learning this knowledge and it's not changing you, it's not making a difference in you, then something is wrong. The answer to that is not to stop seeking knowledge, but the answer to that is to go back to your niyyah, correct yourself and to uh, turn to Allah and to renew your niyyah. Of course, if the knowledge is voluntary, yes, it could be a case that the person says, well, Allah, this knowledge didn't benefit me. It's, it's harming me because it's not changing me. I'm not improving. So, you know, I'm going to go to a different aspect of that knowledge, go to a different area, different field. But if we're talking about the knowledge that is obligatory upon every Muslim, you don't have an option to leave it. But if you don't see yourself making changes, if you don't see yourself getting closer to Allah, then you have to ask yourself, why am I getting this knowledge for? Al-Hakumut-Takathar. Just so I can become busy and become preoccupied with numbers. So I've memorized more and I've learned more and I've sat more and I've studied more. But ultimately, what does that mean if it doesn't make you actually change? And in this, we're going to quote an ayah. And the ayah is in Surah Al-Zumar. Allah Azza wa Jal said, أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةَ وَيَرْجُوا رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah Azza wa Jal, He told us, As for the one who is standing obediently all throughout the night, the person is standing all throughout the night in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that person is hoping for what is with Allah Azza wa Jal, fearing the hereafter, hoping for the mercy of their Lord. The person who is in that situation, man huwa qanitun ana al-layl, standing in obedience that, that night, sajidan wa qa'ima, in a state of prostrating and standing up in the, you know, in the qiyam, in the prostration. And that person is fearing the hereafter and hoping for the mercy of their Lord. And then Allah said, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ See, are those who know equal to those who don't know? Taib, what's the evidence here? The evidence here, or the wajhud dalala, the reason, the, the, the reason why we brought this here, this ayah here is, Allah described knowledge in terms of what? The knowledge, knowing versus not knowing, in terms of what? In terms of action. Knowledge means you stand at night in prayer. Knowledge means you fear the hereafter, what will happen. Knowledge means that you hope in the mercy of your Lord. Knowledge means that you submit to Allah. That's the difference between الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ As for the one who just gathers ijazat or gathers qualifications or just gathers knowledge for knowledge's sake, this person is not described with knowledge aslan. This person is not described with knowledge. لا يقال It's not said about that person that they have knowledge. You don't say to that person that that person has knowledge. Knowledge is only to the extent that you act upon it. And that's a lesson we have to drill into our children. Look at what she said, this, the, the mother of Sufyan al-Thawri, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. And, and what will make you know, perhaps she received all of the benefits and all of the ajr from uh, the, the huge efforts that her son did. Perhaps that's the case. Perhaps she received all of the benefits from that because she sent out her son and she said to him, go and write 10 hadith. Some narration she said to him, go and write 10 letters. And if you see that this has changed you, you change the way you behave, the way you are, the, the manners, you know, the way you fear Allah, you see a change in yourself, then this is for you. No, you know, go write 10 more. And if not, then know that this knowledge is harming you but it's not actually benefiting you. And that's an excellent lesson we can instill in our children. You go to the school, you learn to ayah, you learn to hadith. What has this hadith done for you? What has changed 
for you? What's different for you? What have you learned? What are you doing today that you didn't do yesterday? And yet, yet, if we see that our children are not changing, it's not stop going to school, stop learning, stop going, you know, stop memorizing. But it's a case that we tell them and we continue to emphasize to them that the only benefit in knowledge is that which you act upon and implement. And now we're going to come to the last point that I'm going to discuss with you, but it's going to be a little bit of a long one. So it's going to take a little bit of time to go through. And that is that your children, they need a roadmap. They need a roadmap. Sometimes we call it a manhajiya, uh, a curriculum. They need a roadmap. If you were to leave anyone and say, go and become a scholar. Go and become a scholar. Wallah, you'll see the person will not, subhanallah, illa man rahimallah, except the one Allah has mercy on, that person will not even be able to reach outside of their home for the confusion they will be in. You'll see them going backwards and forwards and inside and outside. You know, like hayran, they have no understand, like lost. Because if you don't have a roadmap of how to achieve something, then how do you ever hope to achieve it? And that's why some of the some of the the, the, the scholars of the past, they said that it's not a lack of intelligence that, that is the reason, I'm paraphrasing, it's not a lack of intelligence that's the reason why most people don't achieve knowledge or don't get the knowledge they want. They don't become what they want to become. It's not a lack of intelligence, but it is not knowing the way to learn. And I, I also can relate to this when I, I, when I first started studying and uh, when I went to the Islamic University of Medina, I remember, Allah, like I remember, and the university was so helpful providing all those resources, but still, even though the university was there providing those resources, I still felt lost. I still felt like huge amounts of my efforts were being wasted. Like the person who is running and like on a treadmill, you know, you're running and running and running, but you're not moving anywhere. You never went anywhere. Like I had that feeling many times. And then I came across some of the books in which the scholars spoke about seeking knowledge and how to seek knowledge. And subhanAllah, I realized from those books, uh, and I appreciate it, that the problem was actually that I didn't have a roadmap. Not a real roadmap. I mean, no doubt the university provided amazing resources in terms of uh, study materials, teachers, but I didn't have a roadmap for where I wanted to go. And the purpose of that roadmap is not that I've reached the end of it, subhanAllah, I haven't even reached the, the beginning, you know, the, the very first stage of it. But ultimately, if you have a roadmap, you can see what's ahead of you. You can see what I need to do. What do I extra do I need to learn? Where, which books am I going to study? Otherwise, wallah, you can go into a library, put your child in a library and just say, become a scholar. How do they know out of the thousands of books, maybe hundreds of thousands of books in that library, which one is going to make them a scholar? Which one is going to make them a serious student of knowledge? Which one is going to progress them and which one's going to set them back? Which one of them is going to be a waste of time and which one of them is going to be a benefit? How would they know that if they don't have a road map on where to go? You can't memorize everything, right? Your hifth has a limit. Even the one who is, you know, ahfav min ghayrihi, they, they have better memorization than others. You can't memorize everything. So that means that you need to now have a roadmap of what to memorize and what to understand. So ultimately, all the things we've mentioned in the last few episodes uh, regarding your children, it all comes down to this, giving them a roadmap for seeking knowledge. And like we said, at the end of the day, whether where you reach on that road, that's in the hands of Allah, Azzawajal. you work hard, put your trust in Allah, turn to Allah, ask Allah. You know, at the end of the day, we can't promise anyone where any one person will reach on that road. But at least if you have a roadmap, the thing that will, it won't be the fact that you got lost was the reason why you didn't win the race or why you didn't achieve what you wanted to achieve, which is the case for so many people. You know, SubhanAllah, they have the strength to get to their destination. They have the intellect to get to their destination. They have the abilities to get to their destination. But because they didn't know the right way to go, the example is like two people in a race. One person was fast and strong, the other one wasn't quite so fast or quite so strong. 
but the one who was fast and strong didn't know the way to go. So they ran all the way, a long way around, and they end up not getting to where they wanted to go, and perhaps they wouldn't even get beyond the start line because they didn't have a roadmap. So this being a short episode, not being a long episode, and this is not a course, subhanAllah, this course has, has, has grown to become more than I thought it would be. Walillah alhamd. But uh, because this is not the course to talk about the details of this and, and the individual points on this, and this is something that we would, inshallah ta'ala, uh, direct people towards the other content that we have with regard to Al-Madrasat al Umariya. Uh, but what can we give the parents as an overview of this roadmap? How can we, in a few minutes, give the parents an overview of this roadmap? So al Zabidi rahimullah ta'ala, in his al fiya he has a couple of lines of poetry in which he basically gives you the roadmap immaculately, very beautifully, in just a couple of lines. So to be honest, if you memorize them, it will be good for you because we said about hif and and fahm, memorization and understanding. He said, فَمَا حَوَى الْغَايَةَ فِي أَلْفِ سَنَةَ شَخْصٌ فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنٍ أَحْسَنَ بِحِفْظِ مَتْنٍ جَامِعٍ لِلْرَاجِحِ تَأْخُذُهُ عَلَى مُفِيدٍ نَاصِحٍ He said, فَمَا حَوَى الْغَايَةَ فِي أَلْفِ سَنَةَ شَخْصٌ He said that a person will not be able to reach the, the end, the ghaya of knowledge in a thousand years. If I said to you to read every book that the scholars of Islam have written and memorize every statement that the scholars of Islam have made and memorize all of the ahadith that have come to us and the explanation of those ahadith and the tafasir that have come to us and the explanation of them, in a thousand years you would not reach your destination. You wouldn't be able to achieve it in a thousand years, let alone between 60 and 70 years, which is the average age of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you say that a person starts at, you know, 10 years old or 7 years old or 5 years old, SubhanAllah, maybe a person only has 60 years of learning. And in a thousand years, they couldn't reach it. So what should you do? فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنٍ أَحْسَنَ So from every single branch of knowledge, take the best of it. So first of all, what we want to take here is that Zabid rahimullah ta'ala, he divides knowledge into funun. He divides Islamic knowledge into branches. And that is how Islamic knowledge is. Islamic knowledge is not one big topic, Islam. It's lots of little branches. And that's the first thing you need to do to become a talib ilm is to appreciate that Islamic knowledge is not one topic. On a very basic level, we do things like Islamic studies. You know, we teach our children Islamic studies, which kind of gives you the impression that all of Islam is one topic. But that's not actually what it is. It is actually many different funun, many different sciences. So let's look at just some of the sciences. The Quran is a science. And even the Quran can be broken down into sub-sciences as it relates to ulum al-Quran, like ilm al-tafsir, the knowledge of tafsir what is commonly today called ulum al-Qur'an, the knowledge about the Qur'an, you know, in terms of how it was preserved, written, the different styles of recitation and so on. If we look at, just for example, I'm just picking, I'm not going comprehensively. If we look at, for example, hadith, then you have a hadith relating to uh, fada'il, relating to virtues, the virtues of doing good deeds. You have a hadith relating to ahkam. You have the jawami' the big books of hadith, the Kutub al-Sitta, for example. Uh, and then you have also a hadith that, or you have the science of hadith and the supporting sciences that relate to mustalah al-hadith. Things like uh, the, the science of what makes a hadith sahih and what makes a hadith ta'if and what makes a hadith hasan and so on. All of this are, these are can be divided into some kind of sub-sciences. Likewise, even the Arabic language can be subdivided. We talk about an-nahu, as-sarf, balagha, and so on. All the different uh, 
sciences of Arabic, and there are other ways. The purpose here is not to, to list all of the different sciences. Fiqh also can be divided up. You have uh, fiqh in terms of the, the madhab, studying a madhab with a, curri a curriculum in order, and then you have the usul, the principles, the qawaid, fiqhiyya, uh, the principles of fiqh, you have the fundamental science of fiqh that, that, un that kind of underpins the science of fiqh. You have alongside that maqasid, a sharia uh, you have the the purposes behind islamic legislation so the the, perp, the point is that islam is not one topic it's not just one thing islam it can be broken down and different scholars break it down in in slightly different ways but ultimately generally speaking it's broken down into a series of of subjects of funun in each one of those funun, each one of those subjects, each one of those sciences, we want our children to take the best of it. To take فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنِّنْ أَحْسَنَ Take from every science the best of it. And what we mean by the best of it, and, and uh, here the poet continues by explaining that, but what we mean by the best of it is that you're going to have to be selective. I can't read every single thing that has been written on tafsir. Tafsir is just one science from the many sciences that make up Islam. I can't read everything. So I'm going to have to be selective to choose the best things that I need to read. Might just not might not just be one thing. It might not just be one thing. But at least I have my focus and my energy is on certain core materials. And I think that there's a couple of things I would like to highlight here that parents might do or might fall into mistakes in. Number one is only giving attention to one fen and not the others. One science and not the others. So what we see is, for example, only giving attention to, for example, the Quran uh, in terms of hifth, but not giving attention to tafsir, not giving attention to the other aspects of ulum quran not giving attention to hadith, not giving attention to fiqh, or only giving attention to fiqh and not giving attention to hadith and so on. You have to have all of the sciences at a basic level. And that doesn't mean that you have to be, you have to be an expert in all of them, at least not in the beginning, but in the beginning you have to have a general understanding of all of them. Not that you just have an understanding of one or two. If you want to go further down the road, if you don't just want to stand at the minimum amount of knowledge, if you don't just want your children to get just the bare minimum, then your child needs to go beyond that. They need to have a basic understanding of all of these different funun, all of these different sciences. And ultimately, the material in every science in itself would take a thousand years to finish. So how can you do it? You need the best of the material. You need the books that gather the most benefits and the most important points and the ones that you would say, these are your core. And that's why one of the, the benefits that we saw from some of the students of knowledge is that what they do is that this core books that they had, the core books they have, the most important books they have, all the benefits they find in the other books they read, they bring them and they put them onto they write them and they transcribe them onto that those core books that they have. For example, it might be uh, in uh, it might be something related to an, a particular explanation. It might be an explanation of a particular book. It might be the explanation of Kitab al Tawheed, for example. All of the benefits that person reads about uluhiyah, about the worship of Allah and the Tawheed of Allah and His worship, they go back to that explanation of Kitab al Tawheed and they write. They write it on the margins there. So they bring their knowledge to a core subset of material. And that is essential if you want your child to be really, really proficient in knowledge. And ultimately, I feel that, again, my own personal experience, and, and I, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you in terms of if you see where, you, you know, your brothers fell short, then, you know, inshallah ta'ala, you guys won't fall into that same mistake. Is that so much of time is wasted uh, in material that isn't from the core material. And ultimately what you realize is that for all those dreams of reading, you know, thousands of, of books, 
But ultimately, if you don't have that core material locked down and you don't really understand that core material in a very detailed way and you're not proficient in it, all that extra reading, it doesn't actually uh, benefit you in the way that you would hope it would. Whereas the extra reading benefits the one who has that core material because everything is in reference to that core material. So you have to select certain books, certain texts, certain uh, things to memorize, certain explanations and put your energy and your emphasis and your effort into them and then branch out into the complicated things and the difficult areas and the complicated masail and the buhuth ilmiya, the research. But until you've got that core locked down and you really understand the core of that knowledge, all of that extra stuff is not going to benefit until you have that core. And that core means in every single science of Islam, you have the best of it, the most important of it, the best of it. فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنٍ أَحْسَنَ بِحِفْظِ مَتْنٍ جَامِعٍ لِلْرَاجِحِ You memorize a text, and that text is جَامِعٍ لِلْرَاجِحِ So memorizing a text here, the poet he is indicating, rahimahullah ta'ala, that to achieve this, you can't just read. Just reading is not enough. You know, I read this book, I read this explanation. You have to choose certain things to memorize, but you have to be picky. فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنٍ أَحْسَنَ Take the best of every science. You have to be picky now. You can't just memorize everything because most of us don't have the ability to just memorize everything like that. Instead, what we have to do is be selective about what we memorize. So subhanAllah, again, I see that a lot of the times we see the students of knowledge starting off memorizing lots and lots of things and maybe even some of their teachers are encouraging them to memorize and memorize and they run out of steam and they end up memorizing lots of things in one fen, in one science, but maybe not necessarily the best of it. So again, focusing on having a small text or a medium-sized text in every science that you memorized it and you understand it. And if you want to go to the, the maximum level in that and you memorize something like an alfiya in every science, then, you know, this would be really, you know, for someone to, someone would really have gathered a great deal of knowledge through that, through memorizing, for example, a thousand lines in every science. That would be among the, you know, the, the upper, sort of towards the upper limits that a person memorizes like a thousand lines uh, in every science, for example. And of course, there will be people who do more than that. Don't get me wrong. That you have at least one small and maybe one medium size text memorized in every science, this will give you the foundation to be able to succeed. And it's what will give your children the foundation to be able to succeed. But this text that you choose, there are so many options. Which one do we choose? It has to be jami' lirajih. It has to gather together. It has to be jami' lirajih. And rajih means the correct it can mean the correct opinion or the preferred opinion. Now, what we take from this, one of the benefits we take from this, is that we should stick to the books and the texts that are well accepted, that are comprehensive and they have wide acceptance. It shouldn't be the case that we encourage our children to memorize things that are rare and not heard of, Rather, we should memorize that those, those texts that are, have wide acceptance. So, for example, there are many, many books on the ahadith of ahkam, the ahadith of rulings. Many books. But you rarely can find a book that has the acceptance of Bulugh al-Maram, for example. That it's just so widely accepted around the world. So many people, so many explanations. Uh, so many people teaching it, so many people memorizing it, so many explanations of it. So this would be a good candidate of what we would call a metan, which is jami' lirajih, a text which gathers together and it has within it the conditions of acceptance. In other words, it's widely accepted. And sometimes, subhanAllah, we even encourage the memorization of a text where there might be a better text, 
but because the other, the, the first one that we're recommending to people, this text is considered to be the standard, the de facto standard that everybody goes upon. There might be better books. We give an example in Usul al-Fiqh al-Waraqat. Al-Waraqat, which is a, a fundamental, basic level text in Usul al-Fiqh. There are better texts in Usul al-Fiqh than al-Waraqat. There are better texts, and I'm talking about even at a basic level. There are better things that have been written in a, in, in a better way. But none of them have the acceptance of al-Waraqat. That wide acceptance that they've been accepted and taught and explained by so many people all over the world. So you try to focus on those texts that have wide acceptance, that the, the children can really tie themselves to that text. And even though that text might not be perfect in the sense that it has some faults and, and issues and maybe it doesn't cover everything, but it's got the acceptance to find all the explanations and teachers and so on. But this text that the child takes, who should they take it from? You take it from the one who is going to benefit you and the one who is nasih, a sincere advisor to you. And this brings us to the last part, that when it comes to this core material, it's vital that your children take this core material from a qualified teacher. A teacher who is sincere, wanting benefit for them, and a teacher who is mufid, who is qualified to benefit them. And alhamdulillah, again, come back to the role of al-madrasatul umariyah and the hope that al-madrasatul umariyah can fill that stepping stone and be uh, have a place on that road for those students, inshallah ta'ala, to be able to bring this knowledge to them in the English language, to summarize it for them and present it to them uh, for people who English is their first language and to build them up to the level that they can go and benefit from the scholars having that fundamental base there for themselves and then going and benefiting from those scholars and, and gaining that knowledge from its people. And again, here, we, we, we're not saying that you don't study advanced things from the scholars. Of course, we study all of, all of our things we take from our mashayikh, from our scholars. But ultimately, the core material, this is where you really need it. You need to have taken that core material from your teacher. And then from then on, you go on and you continue to go back to your teacher and learn and you also do your own research and reading and so on but that core material it comes from a qualified teacher that's what's really really important so this really just summarizes for you the if you like the overview as a parent of what your child needs to do an overview and i would strongly strongly encourage you once again uh, that if you haven't signed up and registered to Al Madrasa Tul Umariya, please do so. Because inshallah ta'ala, the project is there's a lot of things coming up in the future, inshallah. Inshallah ta'ala, bi iznillah al kareem. There are so many things coming up in the future to help and facilitate this for you. But inshallah, I hope I've given you an, an understanding, an idea, a roadmap of how your child is going to go about it. You're going to break Islam down into sciences. So as a parent, you might say, well, I don't know tafsir. I don't know hadith, I don't know mustalah, I don't know usul al-fiqh. No problem, but you've got that written down. Now, okay, where's my child learning tafsir? Where's my child learning hadith? Where's my child learning mustalah al-hadith? What's my roadmap? So in reality, it's not one roadmap, it's like a roadmap in every individual science until they have the core material. And once they have that core material and you have given them the, the essentials of the Arabic language, then you take that child and you can put them you know, with the, the scholars and the people of knowledge and that child will flourish and, and grow, inshallah. Now, this brings me just to my very last point, which I think is very important. And I know uh, we kind of run out of time in terms of the episode, but I believe this is really important. And that is the role of the Arabic language. Ultimately, if our children were to speak Arabic fluently from a very young age, we would not need as much, or we would not have as much difficulty of this, you know, trying to find a means to get this knowledge to them. Because the Arabic language is ultimately what opens up for you the, the opportunity to seek knowledge. And I don't mean just a basic understanding, just being able to speak it like in the street, being able to order a cup of tea or being able to, you know, go to the supermarket. But 
really detailed, in-depth knowledge of classical Arabic, this is one half of the road to being a scholar. So ultimately, as a parent also, we have to have a program for our children to learn Arabic. We have to have a way for our children to learn Arabic. And there are many, again, many different options. There are classes, there are different books, there are different online options. But once again, we'd advise just stay in touch with Al-Madrasa al Umariya. We've got a lot of things prepared in that regard, inshallah ta'ala. And that's something personally I've been, you know, it's, I'm really passionate about that. I really, really believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give to our children is to give them the gift of Arabic language. And if we give them the gift of Arabic language and those basic fundamental knowledge in each science, then inshallah ta'ala, there's no limit to what our children can achieve, inshallah ta'ala. That's what Allah made easy for me to mention, and Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.